Hello and welcome to the Django DRF and React series. This is the sixth tutorial in this series. If you want to check out any of the other tutorials, then go ahead to the playlist. Um, like I said, we're currently on the sixth one here, so it doesn't mean that you need to run through all these to get to this tutorial. You can watch this tutorial as a standalone tutorial and maybe apply it to your particular project. I do provide all the code, so there's a link in the description for the code for this. So by all means, go ahead and download that and follow the tutorial as we go along. In this tutorial, we're taking a look at or exploring some of the options for filtering data. And then we're going to develop a simple search feature and then go ahead and deploy that in the React front end so that we can make queries on our Django REST for API service. So this is what it's going to look like. This is uh, the front end here in React. Just a simple example or showcase of how to how to potentially implement a search feature in React using a Django backend. So here I'm going to send a, a message to my Django backend. I want to search for all the Django posts. So my RESTful API is going to manage that when I press enter, and then it's going to produce all the Django posts that I have available in my database. Of course, I've only got two. And if I try, for example, maybe I've got uh, React. So I've got one React in the database here. So there we go. So a simple feature ultimately, um, but it does showcase how you can send data or re make search requests utilizing a front end, in this case, React, and the back end using the Django RESTful API. If you have a look at the timeline in the description, I've tried to break down all the different examples that I'm going to show you. So you can just skip ahead or move back and move forward, etc., to where you want to be. So like I said, we're going to go through a number of different examples here and slowly make it more complicated. You can download this code. It's in the description. So you can go ahead and follow me. It's not a problem. Uh, the code will probably be already completed. It will just be highlighted out um, or commented out, sorry. So. This is essentially what we got at the moment. If you're not familiar with this, we are creating a Django backend API. We have two different endpoints here, one for listing out all the data and one for listing out individual items in the database. So we are using JWT, so that can cause some issues if we want to have a look at that in a simplistic way. So first thing that we're going to do is just going to disable JWT so that we can use the uh, API view to easily see what the filters are doing. And then we'll just apply it back on and then go into the React application. So let's just first turn off JWT so that we can have a look at and practice some of these filters in the API view. So if you are using the project files here, just go over to the core and the settings. I've just disabled the default authentication class, which defined us utilizing JWT authentication. So once you've uh, commented in that out, you can then go back in and just go to our API endpoint. This is um, the endpoint or the start point for our API. And you can see here, it's just listing out all the data. So if I go back into my blog API and then go to views, you can see, like I've said, that there's two views here, the post list, which is what you're just seeing here. This is um, the entry point here is showing all the data. And then we've got the uh, post detail, which is going to show individual items. So if I type in a number here, I don't think that is going to work. Nope, because if you look down here in actual fact, what we're utilizing is the slug. So what does that mean? Uh, so if I go into my blog model, this is where the data is being, uh, which is where the model for the database is. You can see here I'm utilizing the slug. So what I'm doing here is if I just go back, if I just remove that, go back to my API, I'm utilizing the blog. I'm taking, so I'm taking in the slug from the URL and putting it into this item here. And then I'm running a query get object or 404 to get one item from a database where the slug equals whatever's in the URL. So let's just go back to here. Um, you can see that this has a slug of this right here. So if I utilize that there, you can see it returns that item. 
Okay, so that's what we're dealing with right here. So let's head over now and start thinking about filters. So I didn't want to make a slide on what filters were. Um, maybe you already have some experience of Django. You know what a filter is. Um, if you're not familiar with filters, essentially just think of a way of getting data from the database and selecting what data it is you actually want to use to display in your program. So a simple example, if you have a database full of apples, different types of apples, but you just wanted to show, for example, Granny Smith apples, then you'd run a filter where you f first would select everything from a database and then you just basically run a filter which is basically going to specify in this case what apple what type of apple you want to actually return from a database and that would then return all the granny smith apples if you have been watching the whole series you know that what we've been trying to do here at least was we allowed the user if the user owned the post if the user actually created one of these posts and then went to this detail page they would also be able to actually edit it. So that's what we were doing here. So this can be achieved in a different way here by utilizing a filter potentially. So let's go ahead and think about building our first filter. So our filters or our query set uh, can be generated from the get query set. So let's just remove the query set from here and imagine we want to customize this query set one of the ways that we can do this is by making an override on the get query set or specify in the get query set what it is or what query or what object, what data we want to return. So this is a way of overriding that setting and being maybe a little bit more specific because here, for example, we generally just uh, specify this. We could put a filter here um, by all means, um, but this looks like a, a much cleaner way of doing this or at least it gives us a little bit more control by overriding the get query set. If you have started to explore all the different um, inheritance or inherited features that some of these different classes have, then this website is a, a fairly good website to um, browse over and just remind yourself of what the imports are for or inherited attributes and methods are for particular classes that are built in in Django. So here you can see we've got the MRO again, which I spoke about in the um, custom, or sorry, the class-based view series that you'll find in this channel. So go ahead and have a look at that if you want to learn a little bit more about that. So this is a method resolution order here, but this is going to just detail how this um, list API view, API view is built, how it runs, the order of play here, we've got methods. So all these methods are, are generated or collected in or inherited in. So we've got multiple inheritance here of different mix-ins and such. And one of these down here, um, you'll notice is the get query set. So this is be essentially, uh, this is being run when we run this class here, this list API view. So we're using list API view here. So you just need to imagine behind the scenes, um, it's actually running get query set. So what we're doing is we're just gonna write some code here, which is gonna overwrite whatever's in there already. Well, that's interesting because what's in there already, if we're not too sure what's in there already on some of these items, we can use the source code. And that takes us to the GitHub Django source code, where we can actually see and start to follow what code is actually running behind Django. So this is actual Django code you're looking at here. This is actually what's happening behind the scenes of Django. So that can be interesting to start to explore, but that's just a little resource for you. Apologize if I'm going on a little bit too much here. Um, if you have followed all everything else, um, maybe you already know this, etc. cetera, but um, for anyone new to this, and you're still not too sure what's going on there, don't worry too much. And maybe that's just something you can exp explore later. And no doubt we'll cover more on this channel. Okay, so now actually we'll go ahead and build a filter. So let's go and build a filter now, which um, will show or will return from the database only posts that the author actually owns. So what we're gonna do here is we're going to, from the request, gather the user. Now remember the user's logged in. 
So the user has to be logged in, is authenticated to even access this view or this data. So we are logged in. And now what we're going to do is through the request that's returned from making a from the user making a request, we're going to get the user information. And now we're going to run a filter. So we're now going to return data. So this is where we use return. We're now going to return data from our post database or post table. So we're just using post objects as per normal. And then we run the filter. So here the author equals user. Now what I'm doing here is uh, in the models here, you can see that I have author here and it's a foreign key to the user table, but we're using a custom table in actual fact. So, but that's generally what's going on here. So what we're going to do, like I said here, this is a simple filter that will filter out all the results based upon the unit user ownership. So if the user has made a post, this is going to show their posts only. So this is a type of filter you might utilize, for example, if you make a admin or a dashboard area for users so that they can see what posts they've made um, and maybe edit them straight away or maybe all the comments that they've made. This could ideally also be um, utilized on comments to show what, what they've done specifically. So let's go back into the front end and have a look at this. I think we're over here. Um, so we've got API, refresh the page, and here we go. So author number one, I'm logged in as this user called AAA, which is the first user of this system and they're author number one. You can see here, they've made three posts. So let's just go ahead and log out and I'll log in as, I think I've got another user called B. Yep. Okay, so I've logged in as B and you see I'm at this endpoint again. And I've got nothing here because B hasn't actually made any posts. So we can see it's working and the filter is working nicely. And there we go. So that's example one, a simple filter that's going to filter out based upon the user. In the next example here, we're going to filter against a URL. So we're going to take in a URL like this, for example, and we're going to run a filter based upon that data. If you're wondering what's going on here in terms of why we're using this API view instead of the front end, obviously this just makes it easier for us to understand what we're doing. Um, as I previously said, or for us to practice, we can use other tools. We could use Postman, for example, or we could use curl from the um, command prompt, but this just makes it a little bit more visual for you. So imagine, for example, the front end, if you're wondering what this is, this is a an endpoint, don't forget. So we could utilize this endpoint in React to get this data. That's essentially what we're checking for here. What data we're going to return if in React we utilize this endpoint. So let's go back in then. So we can see here, uh, we're going to override the get query set and we've got the slug. So we're gonna take in some data. So in the URL, we're gonna take in that piece of data you saw, the slug, and we're gonna to refer to it as PK. So if I go to the URLs, I made this URL called posts and then the string. So we're gonna be taking in a string. If I were to change that to, for example, integer, that would need to be a number. So I just specify the data type here that I want to use. And this is just a reference name, which I can, which I can utilize to send across the data and reference it in the view. So you may already be familiar with this type of format. So you can see, I'm gonna take the data in and reference it in the view as PK, get the data and then run the filter. So here I'm running the filter against the slug. So if I go ahead now and go back into here, refresh, you can see it is working, but let's just uh, show you completely. So go back to our API, let's select another slug here. Let's just run it against that. So remember we're using slash posts, slash, and then this time number three, and you can see that it's working. So that could be a functional feature that we could utilize to show individual posts in the front end. Of course, we're not limited to just specifying or filtering by slug. We've got all these different parameters here that we can filter by. So for example, the ID, just to show you that very quickly. So we can use the word slug still, or we can still use this um, variable slug here. Uh, but here we've just changed the, um, the filter basically. And then go into the URLs, I've changed the string to the integer. So we're just taking numbers. And obviously now, now we should be able to um, generate posts based upon their ID. So this is a four, for example, ID four and so on. 
So that's just using numbers instead of um, slugs or names, if that's preferable in your situation. So there we have two simple filter examples. I'm sure maybe at this point you can see where that might come in useful in your project and how you can utilize them. First of all, hard coding in items to return data and then using dynamic URLs to filter out data and return specific data. So previously I was using the list API view. I just wanted to show you that it works on other API views here. So now I'm using the retrieve API view. If you're not too sure where that is, if you just scroll down, apologies. Um, I've listed, listed all the view classes here. So retrieve API view used to read only endpoints um, to represent a single model instance. And of course, this is what we're looking at here, a single model instance. So this is probably a preferable view to utilize in this case. So if we go back and have a look, oh, we're still using ID, remember, you can see it still works. So we can utilize these on multiple different API views. So now let's move over to filtering against query parameters. So what that means is that sometimes we create search facilities in our application and typically we create, for example, variables in our URL like this, for example. So slug, we have some data, um, name pair here. So this would be the um, name of this parameter or variable where we're storing this data here. So that's the setup here. Um, name pairs here. And so if I wanted to get to this data, I'd need to reference it by slug, for example. So um, we would utilize something like this, for example. And maybe what we can also do is add more items to it and so on. So we might have multiple deep queries that we're utilizing. And typically you might see this um, from a search engine, for example. So how can we take in that in with Django and utilize it? So let's have a little look. So let's go back into our code. Uh, we're going to just uh, override this here. So we're just gonna get rid of all this and rebuild it exactly the same, but utilizing this new system. So in order for us to do this, we have the, in Django, we have the request query params get, and that's gonna get the parameters. So let me just show you that. So here, I'm not gonna take in the, um, whereas previously I took in the argument, if you remember, and that was ID and I moved it to this variable. Now we're gonna collect data from the URL. So what we don't need to do now, if we work this way in the URLs, is that we don't need to define the data here like we do normally. So I can rem remove that now. And now I'll go back into my view because the whole URL gets passed over to Django. So now I'm asking it to read it. So I'm gonna specify what data to get. So here I'm gonna get the data from the slug item. Now remember, if I go back in here, the slug item is holding this data here, post one. So now I've just collected that data. I can now go in and just run my query as per normal. So it's exactly the same code as previously. Used post.objects, um, we've got the filter. And of course, um, sorry to confuse things, we, we are in the um, get query set again. So let's just put that in. Apologies for not making that clear. So there we go again. So hopefully that will work. So let's give this a go. So in actual fact, that causes an error. So what I didn't mention previously, what I specified, sorry, I think I said previously, um, that sometimes when we utilize these different view classes, not everything is gonna work for us. So if you remember, we moved across to the uh, retrieve API view. That's where we were previously. So if I go back into the code here, you'll notice that I changed it to list API view and it was working. This is what you're seeing here. So you can see that I've used the slug equals and then the actual name of the slug to retrieve the data. But in actual fact, if I move that to a, a retrieve API view, then you'll see that in actual fact, that doesn't work. So although we're not gonna go into the detail why that is, um, you just need to be aware that that could be the case. So if you do have an error like that, it could be that you just need to utilize uh, a different view class here until you maybe you learn a little bit more about view classes and what's included. Of course, there's a resolve here, but that's a little bit out of context for this tutorial for now. Um, so at least we have a solution to maybe a problem like that. So now we can move on to the next stage. 
So here we have the evolution, if you like, of filtering. We started with basic filtering, uh, which was static filtering. Then we moved on to, to dynamic filter, right? filtering, utilizing an argument that we send through utilizing the URL. And now we've looked at actually taking the request URL that gets sent across. So we go into the request and we look at the details um, of the request and then we can then select items from it. So I didn't mention um, that we can obviously utilize multiple items here. So that is also possible for us to do, but we probably have better tools to do that. And that's why I didn't give you an example here because sometimes you want to obviously filter against multiple items. So let's just move ahead to something a little bit more powerful, uh, which is the Django filter backend. So I just wanted to bring this to your attention, Django filters 2.3.0. So this would be a, a great example of creating multiple filters. Um, you can see here that we just need to download pip install Django filter, and then you can go ahead and install apps as per normal. And then you can see here, this is how it's generated. So we're gonna create a new class, and I'm gonna create some meta. We're just defining the model and the fields. And that's then going to enable you to generate um, and filter based upon multiple items really easily. So the reason why I didn't install this um, because I'm using Django 3.1 um, and currently this isn't supported. You will get an error, a six error, potentially if you utilize this, but if you're utilizing 3.0 downwards, then definitely go ahead and give this a go. But we're gonna move on to the next step and have a look at some more advanced filters. So back working with the REST framework here, we're going to just import from the REST framework filters. So this is gonna give us a number of different options, a little bit more powerful than what we've seen so far, where we can then generate uh, some more advanced filters. So particularly here, we're concerned with search. So let's go ahead and have a look to see what we can do. So we're gonna build a new class here. I'm gonna call this post list detail filter this time. And we go ahead and we're going to bring in the query set as per normal. And then we're going to need the serializer. And then we're going to specialize, specialize. And we're going to specify the filter backend. So here we're extending from filters and we're gonna be utilizing the search filter. So this is gonna work in very much similar to what we had before where we use the endpoint and then we use the question mark to build a structured format to take in different parameters and then run a filter based upon those parameters. So here it gets a little bit more detailed and there's more options. So with this search capabilities comes these new tools. So we can search by, for example, starts with. So someone will type in a few letters and then we can match anything in the database that starts with those letters. So this is very much uh, search orientated here, isn't it? So we've got exact matches and we've got full text search. So if you're familiar with search and databases, you'll know what full text search is. We're not utilizing a Postgres database, so we can't utilize this tool, which is a powerful tool that we can utilize for searching. Uh, we're just using the SQL Lite here, so we won't cover that. And then we've got this reg X. So regular expression search. So again, we've got some powerful tools in regular expressions um, that we can utilize to generate more powerful features. So in actual fact here, we're just going to concentrate on the two basic functions here, uh, starts with and exact matches. So if you remember before, we were utilizing the slug. So we just need to specify what we want to uh, search against here. And I'm using slug. So this is start with, so I'm utilizing the top hat here. So I'm gonna need a, an endpoint for this. So let's go into my URLs and let's utilize one of those. So I'm in the URLs. Um, so I'll just go for this one, the search and then custom. So that will be my endpoint now. I'll just hook that up. Okay, so we've got the endpoint now, search custom. So let's go ahead and give this a go. So if you look at trying it in a normal way, as we've been doing before, slug equals whatever, it won't work. So this takes in a, a keyword called search. 
and you can see that now it's working. So I've typed in search equals Django. I'm not getting anything back. So let's just double check to make sure um, we're going to be searching on the right thing. So let's see what we got. So we're um, searching on slug here. So we do have slugs that start with Django. Let's go back. So it does say exact match. And this is why we're not making a match. So if we move back to the uh, top app here uh, and then go back, you can see that when we go back, we are getting a match. So this is a Django match. So this slug starts with Django and we do have a React item. And now I'm pulling back the, it starts with React. So the slug starts with React. And obviously I can hook this up to other items here if I need to. So now we have this tool in actual fact, we can now move across to React and build a very basic search functionality, which is based upon searching on related strings that start with what someone types in. Obviously this isn't gonna be a very powerful tool, and in later tutorials, we move across, across to the Postgres database and then we utilize all the more advanced functionalities that's going to provide us a little bit more powerful search feature. But let's just go ahead and put this into practice. So we're now going to go and move to React, build a new component, and then just showcase this working. So let's just first of all, before we do that, go into the settings of our core and we're just going to turn on the we're going to turn back on the authentication because we'll be utilizing React, which is already set up with the authentication. So um, we know it's turned on. If I refresh, if I refresh this, uh, we should get authentication credentials were not provided. You can see here that we're going to be utilizing JWT. So now let's go ahead to the front end and have a look. So to build a search facility, we need to know where we're pointing the search to, or what endpoint we, we're utilizing. So that's the first thing that we need to remember, I think here. So let's just go back into our Django here and let's just go to the blog API URL. So we're pointing here to search custom. I'm just gonna replace that and just go for search to, to make it a little bit easier. So we're doing, so I have pre-written all the codes. So I've just tested it out and our Django app is working. So let's now go into the app and have a look at see how this is developed. Okay, so this code is from the previous tutorials. We are building upon this. So you can see that we are quite far into this project now. So by all means, have a look at the other tutorials in this series, but you should be able to pick this up if you're familiar with React, what we're doing here. Or you can have a look at the code, of course, just download it and have a look. So I'm gonna just take you through what's going on here. Um, so let's just drop this down. So. We do have a system whereby we can log in and log out. I haven't sorted this out yet, the interface, but you can see that we can log in and log out, get tokens and so on. So when we type in something here, this will allow us to then search, send a message to the Django backend and we then produce, based upon the slug, a result. So what we've done here to extend this is we've just added a search component. So I've got this search component here. Um, Again, what we've done is we're using state and effect here. Um, that's just for the effect for the search bar, which can expand when you click on it. Um, that's just a material UI thing. So I've just copied and pasted a material UI example. And you can see that we've got all these items here that we're utilizing from material UI. So this is all the front end components that we're bringing in. What you're seeing here is some styles. So these are just some custom uh, styles that we're using on the page and um, that's overriding some of the material UI items. And this is the main point or point here that we want to have a look at. So here we've just got styles. This is just to do with material UI. I've got this constant here of uh, search, uh, just to make the search um, request, that's all. And there we've got the state. So there's two items in the state, the posts that get returned and also the item that the user types into search. Okay, so now we know what the user's typed in and we can get the data back. So what we're doing now is basically using use effect to send an Axios request. So we get request and we're using search, which just holds the word search. I uh, don't really need to do that. Um, plus 
and then I need to slash. So don't forget that. So remember I'm using a, a folder structure here or a file URL structure to get to an endpoint. So I need to utilize that, otherwise it won't work. And here I'm using window.location search. Okay, so here I'm gonna stop and just take you now to the header. So this is the header. Um, I've already explained this in a previous tutorial. You can see it's the same type of setup. I've got all the material UI items, bringing in the state and react, etc. So here I've updated this item just here. So this is the update in this tutorial. So you can see here, for example, I've called this um, function here, go search, and I'm using history. So what's happening is when someone types in something into the search bar, they press enter, and then that message gets sent here. And then I push people or I redirect them to the search page. And you can see what I'm doing here is I'm going to build a URL. So you may be familiar with props. So the idea of sending across items to other components, um, values to other components. Here what I'm doing is I'm using history. History allows me to create redirects, but I can add some parameters. So the path is going to be search. So that's the first part here. So I'm using search. And then I can um, include this search attribute here which where I can put in this initial component. Remember to build this search component or request, I need to navigate to my API search, and then I need to use a question mark, the keyword search for this tool, and that equals whatever someone's typed in. So this data here is being generated. If I move down to the search bar component here, this is being generated by this search bar. So what you need to do is just head over to the material UI search bar, just go ahead and install this item here. So I've installed that by utilizing this command here and you can see then there's some details here on how to use it. This is just gonna make it super quick and easy to create a search uh, facility on your page uh, and then have that then sent to wherever you need it. So make sure you install that. Let's go back to the header here. So you can see I've got some values here in the search bar. Um, I got the on request search. So when someone types in something and press enter, that then takes the data um, and then we then go to the function called go search. So we put the data or send the data to that function and then we, we've got that data that the user types in. So on change, so this is a familiar maybe to you, when someone types in something into the search input field, that will update the state. So here I'm setting the state data. Um, up the top here, you can see I've set the data here to search. So as we add more data into the input field, more data will appear here. We're well, not exactly there, but it will be stored in the state. And then here you've got the value. So we can actually see what someone's actually typed in. So that's just going to store the value of the input and show that data in the input field. Okay, so that's a simple search bar, really simple. Um, we're not gonna change the styling. You could of course go over and change the styling, etc. So what's happening is when we press enter, the, the information is being sent into this function. We're capturing that data that the user's typed in and we're using history to push that data across over to the search component. So remember, we've got the data. Now we send it across. So what we do now is we can now configure our URL, first of all, with the word search plus and then we use window.location.search. Okay, so what we're doing now is we're retrieving the information from what we sent across, because here we've made a URL. So here, just to confirm, this will create a URL in our browser, and we'll now be able to extract that data utilizing, excuse me, window.location.search. And that will be the question mark, and um, that will be the word search equals, and then whatever, the person has typed in into the input field just right here. So that's basically what we're collecting. And obviously we can utilize that as part of our Axios request. And that obviously matches the right endpoint to collect the data we need. So uh, that's pretty much how it works. Now there's one thing here, which is a little bit of a hack just to show you, show off this. If you don't use window location reload, what happens here is that History initially, so we go to the home page, we type in something into the search input field, and what happens that takes us to the search page or the search component. So that, now that is available in our application and it's viewable. 
Now, if we were to utilize the search uh, input field again, what happens is that essentially history knows that we're on this search page already. So it's not forwarding us to that page. So that data doesn't go to the page, the search page and get processed and they, nothing else appears on the screen. So by utilizing window location reload, it's a little hack just to basically make the page reload properly so that we can re search again. So let me just show you that in action. Apologize to be so explicit. I'm just going to take that away. Uh, let's just go back into our application. So if I type in something here, Django, we know that that should take us to the Django item. It doesn't do anything at all. How if I go to the blog and press enter, it takes us to Django. So that's what I mean. So if I now search for React, it won't do anything. However, if we just do have location reload, it's just a little hack for now. So that now I can type in Django and it takes me to Django and I can type in React and then it takes me to all the um, React information. So here we are constructing this URL. Remember, essentially, this is what's being sent across over a request plus the word API to our API and that's retrieving the data and then we're saving it. So remember, we are saving the data in the search item right post here. And then a bit further down here, just to finish this off, you can see that we're running a, a map here and everything inside of this map block here is just being returned. And for every item that we have returned, this block is going to um, iterate and print out a new block with all the details. And there we go. So apologies if that wasn't too detailed exactly what was going on there. Um, this is a follow on from the previous tutorial. So I kind of uh, would imagine that you've um, seen those tutorials before. Maybe you have some knowledge of React. If you don't, if you need more support, then just leave a message in the tutorial, uh, in, the, uh, in the comments, and I'll get back to you. So there we go, another example of utilizing Django DRF. This time we explored some of the methods for filtering. Of course, I'm gonna give you more examples, but we would have been here all night potentially. So I've tried to kind of boil that down to, um, and hopefully you saw a nice kind of iterative approach, um, getting slightly more different, more uh, complicated, providing us more tools. Obviously there's some more steps that we can take to learn a little bit more about search filters. I, of course, introduced you to this idea of overriding. Um, that's obviously a big concept if you're new to object-oriented programming, to Django in general, and this idea of inheriting other items in the background. That can be a little bit abstract sometimes and hard to understand, but now's a good time to learn, of course. So we've covered, obviously, basic filter methods. We've gone into kind of URL uh, filtering, custom overrides. We've looked at the Django filter backend. We didn't actually do this. Um, so again, this wouldn't be a function that would um, was working properly. So I wasn't able because of the, the six package and that example I showed you, for example, um, that you could install if you had Django 3.0, that would work on yours. And then we looked at filters, search filter. So there are some other filters that we can look at at a later date. But I think for now, that gives you a general overview of utilizing filters within your project. Again, if you've got any problems or you would like to see other tutorials related to this that are specific to your needs, please just let me know and drop a comment in the comment section and I'll get back to you. Thank you very much and I hopefully I'll see you in the next tutorial.